do it. <laughs> Break a leg. Thank you, Steve. Uh, what I did not say about Tim in the introduction is uh, he is the mayor of Capitol Hill. Right? You can't walk down the street with Tim, but everybody, we go past, like, hey, Tim, everybody knows Tim. Uh, because of the service that he does. And thank you, Steve, for the introduction. I'm Peter J. I'm an addict and alcoholic. Hi, Peter. Uh, my sobriety date is uh, February 25, 2007. Uh, I am very grateful to have experienced uh, kind of sustained abstinence from drugs and alcohol since that date, and I have even had some sober moments mixed in there <laughs> occasionally. Uh, uh, attribution is important. I think we, we're more sensitive, more sensitive to that these days. It's important to attribute your sources. So uh, I want to attribute uh, that uh, Steve has been my sponsor now for 14, 13, yes. 14 years. Yeah. All right, so if I say anything that is uh, offensive or troubles you, it's his fault. Yeah. Uh, you can take it to him. I don't want to hear it. Um, so I uh, am a church-going person and go to literature-based meetings. So uh, I'm kind of used to starting with the literature. So I thought I'd start with uh, appendix number two, spiritual experience. Came to mind this morning, so... That's what I'm reading. The terms spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. Yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety, because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer or suspect are aware of the difference uh, long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerence denial. We find that no one need have any difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery, but these are indispensable. And then this quote, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. Herbert Spencer. All right, after that, I have no idea what's coming out of my mouth. So uh, and it's been a long time since I had this much time to speak. So we'll start at the beginning. Uh, my first drink. Uh, remember my first drink? I think I was five, maybe five years old. Uh, 
I come from a long line of tender-hearted alcoholic men. Probably goes back, I don't know, how many generations. Uh, and my father uh, certainly is one of those, although he doesn't identify as an alcoholic anymore. God bless him, that's fine. Um, but my parents would throw a lot of parties when I was little. So we'd get relegated to upstairs, but we'd sneak down and we'd grab the the dregs. So I remember like watching Poseidon Adventure, Shelly Winters, and like drinking the dregs and eating the, the cherries out of Manhattans. And I, like, I remember the warmth hitting. And I liked that. Right? It was precocious. A little bit. Uh, right? So I, I started, I discovered quite early that there were ways to alter the way I felt. Uh, I was also from a very early age, uh, religiously and spiritually um, prone. Uh, I had what I would now call my first mystical experience, uh, probably the most profound mystical experience of my life at uh, something like 10 years old. Right? And I can still recall it quite Clearly, right? And this was kind of the nature of my life coming up, growing up in an alcoholic household. Um, you know, when I was young, uh, the drinking going on was of a party nature. As I got older into high school, the party wore off. It was not so much fun. It became identified as a problem, I guess, before high school, um, I guess I went to a, like a middle school health fair and I brought my mother Elanon literature and gave it to her and suggested she go. I don't recall it at all, but she said I was the one that uh, kind of 12 stepped her into Elanon when I was in seventh or eighth grade. Um, you know, we, we did the family route and I went to Alateen and uh, my dad did recovery a couple times in high school and uh, my mom became an Al-Anon warrior. So we were deep into recovery and it was not my problem, right? I went because, you know, I wanted to be responsible and go to Alateen and go into those AA halls when they were still smoking and... Uh, Right, but I had a, um, you know, I had an average career with alcohol and drugs. I was a pothead in middle school. I spent all summer between seventh and eighth, eighth grade stone uh, all day and convinced nobody had a clue. I could come home to dinner stone and thought my mother didn't know what was going on. She called me on it. Eventually, you know, I did the usual high school drinking at the same time. I uh, got into Young Life. If people know Young Life, I was very intense about that. I once drank a goldfish for Jesus. I was so <coughs> intense about it. Young Life. You know, pretty normal, normal stuff for a long, a long time, and never, you know, just never. My problem never crossed my mind that uh, I could have a problem. Uh, and carried on, carried on, and uh, ended up going to, um, tried not to, but ended up going to divinity school. I really, it took a few years after college, because who the hell does that? It's crazy. Um, couldn't figure out anything else to do, so there I was, and in Chicago, and in divinity school, carrying on. Uh, end of divinity school, I met my uh, first partner, like I came out in divinity school, met my first partner there, and bonus, uh, he was uh, dealing ecstasy at the time, which was like, <laughs> right, so he had these big baggies, like, it's endless, it's an endless supply. Uh, oh, that was great. Uh, and it was, oof, the party started, the party started at 28. Right, I was just kind of getting warmed up, up to 28, and then the party started. And I was 
year into that relationship, my best friend introduced me to Matt. And I can remember looking back, right? There's a lot of danger signs. So this was the first one looking back. The first time I did it, the very first bump. And I thought, oh, this is what normal people feel like. This is how people live in the world. Like, this is what they feel like. I found it. Finally. Uh, might be a little sign of danger. Completely clueless to that. And carried on for uh, a decade in Chicago. Uh, kind of kept going in our careers and bought a place and everything was fine and you know it started the weekend started expanding a little bit and then the weekends would you know start on Friday afternoon and then they'd go into Monday and they just kind of would get longer and longer lots of excuses going on um, Things started slipping a little bit. I can recall sitting down with my ex and we made a list, right? And uh, here was a, a list of things as long as our drinking and using wasn't affecting these parts of our lives, our relationship, our relationship with families, our work, our finances, as long as these things weren't impacted, then it was okay. We were fine, right? I did not get that we just made a checklist that we were going to start checking things off of that list, which is what we started doing as things got, uh, yeah, they, they started slipping, right? And another danger sign, another danger sign, uh, right? We got into, I did, I did my relapsing before I got into the program and I did a lot of relapsing for the program. We were getting real serious about that. So at one point we locked our drugs up in a safe deposit box in the bank because that <laughs> was going to help us have some control yeah. over this. Like, I don't know, problem? You got a problem? No, no. Uh, you know, and it was, um, but we maintained the, we maintained the illusion uh, in the meantime, um, you know, I'd always struggled with anxiety and depression in my life, and that was starting to, it was starting to have serious, serious issues with that. Uh, uh, I would get into, you know, I'd have an episode that would last for months, months, where I would wake up um, just being consumed at four o'clock in the morning by anxiety. Leading to depression and like the kind of depression where it's hard to get out of bed, it's hard to think, it's hard to be at work because, right, I, I was just so overwhelmed by what was happening in my emotional life, making no connection here. In fact, the solution was more drinking and more using because I could reliably escape those feelings. I had no idea what I was doing, um, but everything was fine. Everything was fine. And then we moved out here, uh, actually went on a mission trip to uh, Africa and came back and my partner told me he'd taken a job in Seattle and we were moving to Seattle. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, it was mostly okay. Moved out here, part of the reason to do that uh that's <laughs> because meth was way cheaper out here <laughs> so wow well, there was a bonus and boy that oh um right so we left most of our social circle well we left our circles our families our left them all in chicago or in the midwest moved out here had very little connection had more access and things started uh, going downhill. Uh, and it was, um, well, we moved out here in 2001 and it was uh, six years um, of things 
picking up speed, going down hill. I ended up working for the church. I'd never done that before. I moved out here to get away from the church because in Seattle, nobody goes to church. And then ironically, I move out here and I get a job at the church uh, in the U district, which was great. It was a great gig. Um, did enjoy it. Uh, uh, but, you know, the insanity of being up like all night long, all night long. And at like three o'clock in the morning, realizing, oh, I got to preach in the morning. I better, I better straighten up. <laughs> and I did. So like I'd stop for a couple hours and take a shower and, uh, and then go preach like that. And then come home and keep going. Um, yeah, didn't still wasn't connecting that there was a problem here. Uh, I started getting real brittle, real emotionally brittle at church, and I started going off on members of the congregation. <laughs> that doesn't go over well, particularly when you are the associate pastor and you blow up at the uh, organist and music director of 30 years. Uh, again, like I did, like I blew up at him and it didn't occur to me that was the end of my career there. Didn't occur to me. And I was so, oh my God, it was so, in the, what felt, what came from that, it was so self-righteously angry about my mistreatment. Um, so yeah, things started getting, getting ugly and the bottom came for me when I, uh, found my hands around my partner's throat and I started it and then he punched me in the face and, oh, uh, Right, that was that was a wake up. This is not who I was raised to be. That finally got my attention. That my twelve year relationship of that was you know it's all right. It would have been a lot better if we had been sober and maybe doing some work, um, which we weren't. Uh, but it was still it was good in it, but it had turned into um, contempt for each other. And that's what finally got my attention. Uh, and at that time, I was, uh, it's already, uh, it's a mutual separation agreement with the church. I didn't get fired, it was a mutual separation. Um, yeah, they just wanted me out of there. Uh, anyway, I was doing a part-time gig at another church. There was a volunteer there. I was, you know, at the point where I had to like do some lines to get to work and be at work. And this volunteer was there working with me and saw me as like, I don't know, this gay American dream guy, like had the Jeep and the two dogs and the husband in the house. And so he started talking to me about how he is in recovery and went to AA. And I thought, oh shit, he can, he can see it. Like he had no idea, right? This was a 12 step miracle. And it was that weekend after Topher, who's a very good friend to this day, my 12-step my angel, um, it was after he said that stuff to me, it's like, oh, good for, good for you, good for you. I'm so, I'm so happy, and I'm thinking, oh, shit. I uh, went home that weekend, and it all stopped working. It didn't matter how much I drank. It didn't matter how much I used. It wasn't working. It stopped working. And <laughs> uh, I had given everything in my life for this and then the bitch abandoned me. <laughs> right? That, this, this was the, like, oh, that was such a horrible weekend, like just staring, staring at the dining room wall all weekend. And I went back to that job on Monday, I said to Topher, you know, I need to talk more about that. 
what you were talking about on Friday. And he took me to PTP. No, he took me to a uh, meeting at St. Joe's on Tuesday night, the next day. What was that? By the grace of God? Yeah. At St. Joe's, best lighting of any meeting in Seattle. Because you could sit in the dark and I wanted to sit in the dark. <laughs> Uh, the next morning, he took me to practice these principles at Chutney's, and I went for, well, it became my home group. I went for a year. I went and I sat and I sobbed every day for a year. Uh, not exaggerating. I would just cry and cry and cry. Uh, it was a lot catching up with me. I uh, felt like I got, uh, I got sober eventually. Because I actually went to PTP for five weeks before I asked somebody to be my sponsor. And at the first sponsor meeting, my sponsor, not this guy, it was another guy, uh, actually suggested to me that I might want to think about considering not drinking if I was going to AA meetings every morning. Because I gave up math. What do you want? And I would just have a couple of small glasses of wine. I think I was drinking most of a bottle every night, but that was just to take the edge off, right? And drinking was just, right? That's when I was being good. That didn't even count. Uh, so it was five weeks of going to PTP every morning. It literally never crossed my mind to stop drinking. I was so shocked when Gary suggested that. And then it... I reset my day count and that has been the case since, but it's like, a, it's, it's always good for me to remember that, the depth of my insanity. Because um, it was deep and it took me a long time to catch up with that, um, to catch up with my soul. Right, because it's a it is a mystery to me how all through this, all through this period, I was very in earnest about my spiritual life. I was a spiritual leader. I actually totally got off on living the double life. Like during the day, I was a spiritual leader. I was leading in the community at night. I could do like doing anything and everything. And I thought, like, this is life. This is these poor suckers. Like who don't get the dark side, they only have the light side. And I, uh, right, I, I didn't know what I was doing to myself and doing to my soul and by doing that, right? So it is a mystery to me how I could be so involved, and it wasn't like it wasn't bullshit. Uh, it was real. There was good experiences going on. There was growth and. And I was removing myself progressively from the sunlight of the spirit. And, you know, truth be told, I am still healing from that because I spent decades living that double life. And like they say, if you walk a mile in, you got to walk a mile out. So I am still, I am still recovering from that. It took, um, it took a decade, it took a full decade of continued abstinence and being part of the program and being serious about my spiritual life. And I tried to be very in earnest about that. My favorite uh, story in the big book is the whiskey and milk guy, because they tell you before the story what happened. Before they give you all the details, they say, this guy failed to expand his spiritual life. And here's where it went, right? So I am in earnest about my spiritual life. And it took a, it took a full decade, really, a decade before I got to the point where uh, anxiety wasn't waking me up at four o'clock in the morning and just eating me alive and struggling with depression. Something happened about a decade where that, that lifted, right? I would listen to the promises and all those meetings and think, yeah, I'm bullshit, uh, right? That, that's not gonna happen, Kareem. Our whole attitude and outlook 
how life changed. Right. Uh, it did. And it took a decade for that to happen. And I am not done. Right? I'm kind of, uh, for whatever reason, uh, kind of in a bit of a anxious phase recently. Uh, my dog is, I mean, that's part of it. My dog has got cancer and a couple weeks ago, I thought, I'm, I'm like, this is it. Um, and I had one morning like, oh my God, this is what it used to be like. Oh no. Um, and it was a dipping into it. And it's, it's not like it was, but it's, you know, it's not perfection. I don't think it works that way. Um, Cause the other side of it, I tend to like uh, Richard Rohr's stuff. I like guess daily meditations, morning meditations. Um, this was from this morning. Um, God's life is living itself in me. I am aware of life living itself in me. Like the words are easy to say, <laughs> but this is the miracle. I'm not, in, I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in control of much of anything. Uh, the world is, you may have noticed, the world's on fire. Um, things are in really rough shape. Things don't look good. There's a lot, lot of reason to be anxious. It's a reasonable response. And I am connected with God's life is living itself in me, I am aware of life living itself in me. And I, I think this is very, that's why I started with the spiritual experience. But that's what this is about. I am no poster child for the AA program. Uh, you know, I don't go to the number of meetings that I went to in those early years but I still go. Uh, I'm at a meeting every week, sometimes more than that. Uh, I had the people in my life. Uh, well, yeah, I think the most important people in my life are program people. Uh, there is deeper recovery in my family now, myself included, fully included. In that, uh, it is my problem. It's me too. This is my lineage. Uh, right, so the miracle is so quiet. It's easy to miss. But the promises have come true in my life and continue to come true in my life. And my life is a good life. It's not a perfect life. I am not a perfect man. By any stretch, uh, but I have the opportunity to respond, to contribute, to live in love and compassion, to be aware of life and whatever is going on in this world. Uh, this world is still good and life is good. And this is what I was losing progressively in all those years of using that I, I didn't even, I still can't explain it. How I could be so uh, into the religious and spiritual life and missing it at the same time. This will be the rest of my life actually, is uh, to heal this split that I cultivated for so long, uh, to live more and more in the sunlight of the spirit. And I trust that AA will always be a part of that journey. It is not, right? I spend a lot of time in the church. I spend a lot of Time, I practice, uh, I'm a, a therapist, a pastoral psychotherapist. 
now. Um, right, I live off my spiritual life with my colleagues in the climate psychology realm. Like there are many aspects to my spiritual life. It is not just AA. AA will remain a part of it. And I will never be finished. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful for AA. It blows my mind. This meeting has been going for 83 years in Seattle. That's incredible. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful to Steve for all that he has given me in the last 14 years of companionship and guidance and wisdom. I'm grateful to Tim for his love, for his trust, for his wisdom, his teaching. Uh, I'm grateful that you are all on this boat. Uh, it matters. And it makes a difference. And we all get to know what difference that makes most of the time. And that's okay. So, with gratitude, thanks for the opportunity.